Oh. Thank you. So it's a great pleasure to be here again. It's an honor to speak in Michelle's birthday conference. Um, so I made this slide. You can all guess where I got it from. <laughs> Out of all the slides, I have made only two. My students make the slides. So you see there will be different styles. So some more slides are very easy because they're made by undergraduate students. Some were quite hard. Those very, very difficult are usually made by Rubilar, my Chilean student who makes difficult slides. And uh, some of them are extremely beautiful, many of them with lots of art and so on. Those are all, all made by Bruno Suzuki. He's a, you will see, it's really kind of good. So when I did, when I started at graduate school, the most important thing I learned, I think, is one professor taught us the mathematics is not football. And science is most beautiful when everything goes together and you don't do uh, algebra against geometry against, et cetera. <laughs> Nevertheless, I will explain mathematics via football, as you see, <laughs> that's how it will go. Right, so, I will say some mirror symmetry for some adjoint orbits. So first uh, I want to show where the mirror used to be originally when mirror symmetry was a geometric thing. Maybe I should have only three folds here, but so in the classical Hodge diamond, of course we know the classical symmetries on conjugation and cell and Hodge. So those are the symmetries of the diamond of one fixed smooth variety, projected variety. But uh, the mirror symmetry, the geometric case is when if you have a variety with a certain diamond, then you expect a dual variety whose diamond would be obtained from the first one by exchanging in this picture, red and blue, red and black colors, in which case the mirror would be here, this line that would be where one wants to reflect. So that's where I see the mirror. So I will kind of show different mirrors. Like I said, I have various pictures. So some of the classical ones. So that's, uh, that's how they start with like the very classical, most symmetric possible curve, which then turns out to be mirrored to itself in some precise sense. The K3 surfaces, usual diamonds, and the first uh, example where you actually obtain geometrically that uh, reflection on this 45 degree line between a calabial threefold and its mirror variety. This is not the one I will discuss though. I will talk about homological mirror symmetry. So, and this will be in the sense, one side symplectic, one side algebraic, and one can play. And ideally it should be that whatever I can say algebraically, I can also say symplectically, and so I can see all the phenomena in both sides, maybe in a completely different way, but um, one expects to have both things. So every, every observation should be in both sides. It may be dressed very differently. So I have mirror pictures. First one variety can have many mirrors. Second, sometimes the mirror looks way worse than we want, so we can try to change it. And more importantly, uh, some strange things can happen where perhaps you have stuff that doesn't show in the mirror. I don't know, Maxime himself told me he doesn't believe in vampires, <laughs> so we wanted to look for such. Uh, first, we were doing all algebraic stuff, so I, decided, I wanted to be on the other side too, so we decided to do some symplectic geometry. It's been great fun. So let me state uh, like a short version of uh, homological mirror symmetry conjecture. So when one side uh, derive category of coherent sheaves of some algebraic variety, on the other side, Foucault category of some symplectic manifold and the potential. And uh, all of the left-hand side that Denis explained yesterday, so you know, I explain all by pictures only. So there will be a little bit of explanation of that. Here's my homological mirror symmetry game. <laughs> it's just, so it's, uh, I will, I, I've, just today I thought that I can improve the slides by putting actual players, right? Right now I only have those because 
At the moment, I have mentioned Fukaya category and conserve it as a state in the conjecture, and now we'll play. So on the right-hand side, uh, all the algebraic stuff, sheaves are the left category of uh, coherent cheese, varieties, and the homomorphisms, which then should be dual to floor homologies, Lagrangians, Fukaya categories, symbols, etc. So we play. Uh, so let me describe the symplectic side because that's where we have done most things in the last, I don't know, five years, maybe we've been working on this, maybe a bit more. So for us, this Landau-Ginsburg model will be an A-side Landau-Ginsburg model with, um, for us it will be a simpler tick manifold and the potential, so a function to C or P1. Here's my picture of my Landau-Ginsburg model this cycle, which uh, will, if you move along, will vanish. That's the vanishing cycle. That's, uh, and uh, the figure it will make when you transport them all the way to there will be the thimble. And the whole calculation, the vanishing cycle should be Lagrangian on the regular fiber, and the thimble should be Lagrangian on the total space. Right. Uh, so we wanted to make more examples. So I specifically I was asked because when I was asked the question, there were many, many, many things about symplectic left shift vibrations in dimension four. Um, so left shift vibration, the, the most important condition that I should point out is there will be um, critical points, but there will be the simplest possible type of critical points. So these are uh, non-degenerate non -degenerate singularities, so that locally you can write them with quadratic Equation, so the exact type of singularities you see in Moore's theory. Kenji said that I should explain Fukaya category is a quantization of Moore's theory. Okay, I told you that. <laughs> I hope it's clear. <laughs> okay, uh, right. Uh, but we went at symplectic. So for us, that the first thing to worry about the way for the things we wanted to do is that the regular fiber should be symplectic submanifolds of the total space and other conditions, but uh, that was the first thing to look for. And some more. Right, now, now I don't know what they put, so let's see. Ah, right. So, so uh, they, on four dimensions, then for a, for a manifold to have a symplectic structure, so Donaldson had showed essentially equivalent uh, to have the structure of having a symplectic left sheet pencil. So then you blow up finitely many points, you get a left sheet vibration. So of course, this is wonderful. This explains everything in dimension four. We wanted to do higher dimensional stuff. That was the thing. We wanted bigger dimensional examples. And uh, I started discussing things coming from left sheet pencils, but then I was in Campinas and my then collaborator, become my collaborator, Luis San Martin, he didn't like it because if we have a symplectic pencil, when we blow up, then it becomes uh, the symplectic form that you pull back becomes degenerate on the exceptional locus. You can fix it if there is a lot of things about that, but we thought it was a difficult thing to do. So he proposed a completely different viewpoint Instead of constructing things out of pencils, which you then blow up and so on, to construct directly. So the idea was inside of a, a Lie algebra to take adjoint orbits. Adjoint or coadjoint orbits normally come with a sort of there is a preferred symplectic structure given by a constant Kirillov Surio form, which we tried, and I know also other people that tried, if we use that structure on the simplet, on the adjoint orbits, then you try to put those uh, vibrations and the, the regular fibers here then wouldn't come out to be a symplectic submanifolds at all. It just doesn't, didn't work at all. Uh, so, so Luis had this great idea to put this other symplectic form, which I find much, much easier, which is this. Your complex the algebra has this Hermitian form. If you just take the imaginary part of the Hermitian form, then that's a symplectic form. So we just take that. Then I immediately like it a lot because if you have real sub manifolds, then they're more likely to be Lagrangians, right? Because we are already taking imaginary part. So that's nice, I like that. 
So here is our adjoint orbits, and I, I will work with those. So simply means, so we have here a, to be a complex group G acting on some element H naught. H naught you choose, whichever you like. So you choose your favorite. Usually I'm doing matrices. I will describe things with a group SLN. So you choose your favorite SLN matrix. That's your H naught, any of them. And um, we work with that. So in that orbit, we're now going to describe what's happening. And then, so that's our first result. So you choose now a second matrix. So that will be age. And I'm going to write the potential depending on age. If you take age to be a regular element in the, just take a diagonal matrix, which has all the eigenvalues are different. So all different entries, that's, that's a good age. If you take that, then this function, that's a scartan killing pairing. So you take an element in the orbit and you pair with age. That means product of matrix take the trace. So very, very easy thing to write. So this, which is classically called the height function in Lie theory, gives the adjoint orbit the structure of a symplectic left fibration with all the conditions we need. Uh, the, the regular fibers are symplectic submanifold, the singularities are nice quadratic, exact, everything we need is there. Then of course we can make it as big as you want because you can take whatever Lie algebra and make uh, the, whichever orbit you like. The part I like the most of like the way, the proof is a bit long, I don't want to try to explain, but the part I like most is where the critical points are. You start with H naught. The critical points are the vile images of that. So it's immediately finitely many and um, it's contained. So you can take the compact part of the Lie group and act on the same element that will give you then a flag manifold. The critical points are all inside of that compact part. And um, the orbit itself is diffeomorphic to the cotangent bundle of that flag manifold, but, but not symplectomorphic with the usual cotangent structure. It's a different thing. But in any case, uh, how, how is the orbit? Like, how does it look topologically, let's say? If you think of it algebraically, it's an affine variety it immediately because you take your edge naught, you can take the uh, minimal polynomial corresponding to that, that will give you the equations defining the adjoint orbit inside of the Lie algebra. So as algebraic varieties, these are affine varieties, but as um, symplectically, the, the flag is there as a Lagrangian submanifold and uh, the smooth type is the one of cotangent bundle, right. So that will, how, how much fun can we have with that? So the regular fiber now has the homology of the flag minus the critical points. So that is a lot of homology, really, really a lot. So we're happy about that because all these homology bases are candidates for vanishing cycles later on. And so, right. Uh, now I don't know what comes. Uh, ah, right. <laughs> uh, there were many slides before this one containing the definitions of all the beautiful three uh, reasonably new Hodge theoretical invariants for landau ginzburg models, which my student Rubilar wrote down, but I find the definitions of them very difficult to explain. So I, I commented them out, <laughs> but later if somebody wants to see, I can show. In any case, Kazarkov, Konsevich, and Pantev defined new Hodge theoretical invariants, which then took care also of the potential. So not just of the variety, like uh, we, I was doing the Hodge diamond before, but of the landau ginzburg model. So there are these three definitions and they conjecture that they agree. So in the case when our adjoint orbit is diffeomorphic to cotangent of a projective space, we calculated the three invariants. The definitions are very difficult, I think, to explain and to study, but it was actually, in those cases, they were actually easy to calculate and they all agree. So we drew a diamond, which we just called KKP diamond with the values that we obtained. So the conjecture is true. So everybody said, oh, you're doing the theory. So everything is easy, everything is gonna work nice. Okay, so it worked very nice. Even though it shouldn't work because, well, or, or at least it wasn't obvious because before we did our, work on this KKP diamond things, Luntz and Prijokovsky had already shown that the conjecture is false. 
in two dimensions. <laughs> so we were just lucky somehow that our examples, the numbers agree. It then remains, of course, a question to what kind of uh, landau ginsburg models are those for which the numbers agree. But for us, they did. In any case, we're thinking it's so easy. Okay, let's calculate the, oh, yeah, I want to calculate, calculate a Fukaya category, right? I need to calculate something, which we expect to be simple to calculate, at least in some easy example. Um, right, vanishing cycle. So, so here's here's a vanishing cycle. I will show the details of the SL2 case calculation, and it will look exactly like that. That will be a vanishing cycle that vanishes like to two sides. So there will be one single vanishing cycle, but there will be two thimbles. So our category, our category will have two objects. I have a much more dramatic. <laughs> it's because I, I was once I put that thing and so for a physics audience, and they thought that the vanishing cycle was not a very exciting thing. But uh, this is a star collapsing and then making a monodromy around the singularity. So that. Uh, you can think, I don't know, the planet collapsing. Yeah? So that seems more convincing. So that's for physics. <laughs> so that's the second slide I made. Everything else is someone else's, but that's mine. Right, the definition. So here's the definition that you already explained yesterday. So here's my definition. And uh, so the, the, the objects will be the thimbles and there is a floor homology thing which I will explain by pictures. I have pictures of floor homology, I like them. So our singularities are all quadratic. Therefore, if you do a monodromy around it, you get a classical dent twist. So it's a very, very clear classical dent twist. So I have an illustration of floor homology. This, uh, the, we took the equations from Paul Seidel's PhD thesis and my Scottish student uh, drew. So it's not just art, it's, it's really, with the equations. So we will have cotangent of S2, which will be the space that I will have also for the case of the orbital described. So we take a cotangent fiber. So there's the cotangent fiber. And uh, if you want to calculate the floor homology, what do you do? You take the first entry, deform it like a little bit by the Hamiltonian flow until it intersects transversely the second entry. So here is like the epsilon deformed cotangent fiber. Then you take the second object here, which is dent twist. So this is the dent twist with equations of the cotangent fiber exactly as it is, and the epsilon deformed dent twist. All calculated really with equations, etc. Then you intersect. So F1, F2, and they don't intersect. And F2, F, F oh, and sorry, wrong. One and zero <laughs> and zero one, right. And the zero one, they intersect with the circle. The circle will be important to us because then the potential has a maximum and a minimum on it. It will generate grading on the Fukaya category. Anyway, so that's my floor homology explained by pictures. So now you already expect uh, the result I will describe. So now I take the absolutely simplest possible example because of course we need to calculate. So I take the orbit of this guy on SL2 and calculate. So what is the orbit? So the orbit is all the matrices in SL2, which have eigenvalues plus or minus one. So something very simple. It's a complex surface. This vial group is two points. So the critical points are H naught and minus H naught. Thus they are. Okay, okay, category. Okay, a side of category I should cry maybe call maybe. So my my Lagrange my floor homology story was to make this seem uh, expected that on one side when you intersect the two objects you get zero, but on the other side you get this thing with a grading. So one thing is in shifted by minus one, and that's uh, important. Okay, so now nice, calculated, etc. So now, of course, we have to look for a mirror. And it's so simple, the mirror should be easy. Everybody tells me, oh, it is an easy mirror, etc. And we looked and looked for like six months and we found nothing, <laughs> we try everything. Then I went to Trento and I told Balico, I give me uh, an algebraic variety whose category of coherent sieves is this. 
And he had a big laugh and said, oh, that's ridiculous. Of course, it's impossible. Grant, so then we have a theorem. <laughs> so, there is no middle. so there is no projective variety that will give me that. They said, oh, you don't, you must compactify. So, okay, so we compactify, still nothing. It mm, doesn't work. So what does it mean? It means you take any projective variety, also sub variety of projective variety, whichever, calculate the derived category of coherent shears, and you're never going to get this one. It's just not there. So symplectical and, <laughs> and algebraic zero, you see. So at this point, uh, it's uh, that's how it goes, right? All right. But then you see, I thought it's really disturbing because the news not have you told. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, a, a moment, 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 moment. You continue. It is only the first half. You see, it is. A, I'm not happy either here. So, but oh, wait a moment. Wait a moment. Um, he he's called. He called the bar, no, to decide. Uh, all right. So, but you see. That orbit that I just described, it's so easy, right? It's uh, it's the formation of the cotangent bundle of P1. So let me think, it, all the adjoint orbits that I'm describing, they come as the formation of the complex structure of a cotangent bundle with a flag manifold. And uh, I promise it will change. <laughs> so I'm scared already. <laughs> uh, Anyway, so, but you see, suppose I think for a moment about the cotangent P1, right? Then this is a toric variety. So this is toric game, right? Suppose I want to play toric football. So so if you do the toric mirror, like in the thesis of Patrick Clark, he puts it sort of very clearly. So if you describe the your variety by the matrix of divisors, you describe your uh, potential by the infinitesimal action of monomial. So you have these two matrices. All you have to do is exchange the two. So in this game, you need pairs of twins, right? So that the twins play on the both sides like that. So so it should be working, but but then it immediately gives the the idea that okay, so just put the landau ginzburg model on the other side too, right? It's missing. So I'll try. Uh, Ah, yeah, right. So there's a comment that one can easily cook up a potential on cotangent P1 so that it's self-dual with that recipe. So it was very strange. I like you start with something so easy and then next uh, you get to something that's behaving very badly. Right, so version two. I'm not now, now I'm rewriting the homological mirror symmetry conjecture, but in this way, where now on the right side, on the algebraic side, I'm putting, a, so again, a projective variety, but together with the potential in it. And instead of calculating derived category of coherent sheaves, and I, and I want to calculate uh, all of category of singularities. So oh, let's try that, that's a different thing, right? And uh, let's see what happens. It's kind of so opposite because all the coherent sheaves you take every day, seem to be naturally perfect. When I was trying to look for things which are not perfect, it's like looking for irrational numbers. Right? You know the generic number is irrational, but then when you really see it, there are like three, root of two pi and e. Right? But, <laughs> but it's the same, I was trying to look for uh, shields which are not perfect and it is not so easy to find them. At least it wasn't for me. Anyway, so then this category of singularities is, so now I have um, my variety with a potential on it, and I'm taking the derived category of coherent sheaves of the, now the singular fibers, or modulo the perfect sheaves on it. So, so now I have to sum over the uh, singular fibers of the fibration. Okay, then we'll have to calculate. Okay, fine, but where is X, right? I need an X. Then there is this um, Gross-Siebert recipe, it is uh, it, to, to read it as the difficulty because um, there's so many papers and so many descriptions, but it is a recipe. So you find the next, right? So what you have to do is you, know, you have to um, find that dual pair. It's um, 
it takes a lot of calculation, a lot of work, because you have to do the interse dual intersection complex theta functions. There's punctual gromov witten invariance that as if gromov witten wasn't difficult enough, it has now can intersect stuff in negative intersection in the complex world. That is, it's quite something. So I get a, because it was difficult to calculate, so I went and asked, of course, for help. So with all the instructions possible, one gets a variety. So that is a, a candidate with this equation and uh, one variable as being the potential. And then I calculate that the cat all of category of singularities of that dual candidate and it's exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, so, <laughs> so we're very happy. So here it is. So that is the mirror, the algebraic mirror, right? So what, what is, how is this working? Somehow geometrically after having the dual variety, it somehow seems so simple because when I take the a joint orbit of SL2 and look at it geometrically, it is working precisely like you, you have a sphere. Okay, you have the S2. If you had the height function on the sphere, you have the two critical points and you have the equator, which is how, what is working as my vanishing cycle. So this, this direction is exactly what I had sympathetically. When I do the dual and calculate the order of categories of singularities, it looks exactly like that. Two critical points, a P1 in the middle of them on the same fiber. So it's just like looking at the same thing the other way. It's the SL2 case. It doesn't, the next cases don't happen anything similar at all, because then of course now I want to do SLN. Now I I know now this is pretty. I want to, to I want to continue to higher dimensions. This a matching cycle type of behavior doesn't happen ever again. By topological reasons, the such a Lagrangian sphere will not live inside of the other orbit. So that, that will never happen in higher dimensions. I'll never have for these examples, the case where one vanishing cycle goes to two critical points. But in any case, here we are now. <laughs> See, it was my mistake. I put uh, I put the uh, concept in the wrong place. I say you should always be referee. In which case, every match would come tie. <laughs> now it's good, right? Now we're happier. <laughs> and, uh, now I feel that I can safely get out of the room without the knee killing me. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, all right. Anyway, so now we're good. Then next one. Um, I can construct. So I can write down the equations and get the duo for the case of minimal orbits. So the adjoint orbits, which are diffeomorphic or tangent PN. <clears throat> so I can write down the, the things that the equations that come from the gross Siebert recipe. And uh, the objects are exactly what I need clearly, but, and I can calculate the, the morphisms on that, the, the algebraic side. On the symplectic side, I can calculate half of the cases because when we do like a tangent of P2n, so even dimension, even complex dimension projective space, right? Then the, the vanishing cycles and tumbles live exactly in the same place as the stable manifolds of the real part of the potential. So it's all positioned very nicely and it's good. But when we do P projective 2n plus one, it doesn't work at all. I don't know what's happening, something very strange. When we try to look for the Lagrangians for the potential, they don't agree at all with what seems to be happening on the real part. And we've tried to move them a lot. We tried to write families of Lagrangians. We found lots of Lagrangians on the compactification, but they don't move. They, they are what's called infinitesimally tight in the sense of are not given tau conjecture. Those things are stuck. We can't move one to the other. And so the half of the cases, I have no idea how to write symbols at all. One other half, I so. But in any case, as far as I know, this should work correctly. It's just a matter of learning more symplectic geometry, evidently a lot more. But at least it's going on nicely. So, so this is the this is the these are the results I had to present. All I have now are things that we don't know how to do. <laughs> so, but I have questions for the audience. Some of them are for, of course, more general orbitals, and some of them are about Poisson structures, but uh, simple things which we, that's all we can do at the moment. The first thing is, if we pass to higher 
to, to more general orbits so that the flag is not a projective space. So this is the case of SL3. So in the case of SL3, I have two possible flag manifolds. Either it's P2 or it's the flag manifold F12 of lines and planes in C3. And, uh, and then you can, in the flag F12, you could contract the P1 fiber, right? If you do that, so the black points are the critical points of the case F12. The green points are the point are the, the ones of the case of P2. And if you look at our potential in the Lie algebra, it's a linear thing. So it is, you can see the things moving, like the degenerations moving. I would love to know if anybody has some idea what could possibly be that is mirrored to that behavior. So I am uh, taking guesses, hints. The SL4 case I want to show just because I think it looks very pretty. There's one more of Bruno's drawings. That's the case when you degenerate the full flag just one stop contracting a P1. In any case, that's how things are working. So then we want to do um, non-commutative stuff because it's fun, it's beautiful, etc. And uh, so we did, I, we haven't done a lot for the non-commutative versions of orbits. It's hard. We start with smaller things, but I can show that we have done a lot for these toy calabial trifolds, which we need for physics reasons. For well, the physics has been helping. It's so anyway the physics that that gave me their correct uh, uh, non-perfect sheaves. Actually, I wasn't finding it algebraically at all. But then from the physics of instantons, I knew. So these Calabria trifolds, we need them for purposes of counting of BPS states. So the the first one. Uh, this is the called the resolved conifold. So it's a very popular one. It appears a lot, of, both in physics and in mathematics. I just, I wanted to show because this based on some uh, breakfast conversations, uh, I was asked to show, we can compute all possible Poisson structures. Um, then we need moduli, moduli of Poisson, moduli of vector bundles on the quantized things and so on. So if we take, for example, this Poisson structure, would be just this kind of thing. So some simple um, wedge of sort of partial U1, partial U2. And you calculate the quantum version, means compare the moduli of vector bundles on the original guy with the moduli of vector bundles on the non-commutative guy. With that Poisson structure, it becomes the same. They're isomorphic. We can take more complicated ones, but anyway, in that case, nothing terrible seems to happen. But there are these four generators. They are pairwise isomorphic Poisson structures, but um, we, we don't know how to make the quotient because you can't do sums. So here we need the idea of how to actually construct the moduli of Poisson structure, or at least which one is preferred or what is generic and so on. Uh, we can write the generacy cycles and uh, the symplectic foliations associated, everything. It all seems very simple. The next one, this is cotangent P1 cross C, written in a fancy way. Then we have five generates, but there are four Poisson structures that are absolutely very different from each other with different Poisson structures. And uh, I thought it was long to describe the symplectic foliation. It looks, it's nice to describe, but it's just long. So I just took a Bruno's drawing of the degeneracy cycle. So you see, for example, one has a P1 cross C, the degeneracy cycle. The other one has very little. The other one doesn't have anything at all. So, and so on. So they are very different. And again, the same, like, so what do we choose? What do we do? What kind of moduli? It's uh, so many things seem to be missing, theoretically missing. And then the next one, just to show, I didn't even write now what the E's are, but you see, <laughs> it now becomes huge. And then the drawings of the degeneracy cycles for the next one. So these are the toric uh, diagrams of the that and that. And we are, of course, taking suggestions. <laughs> So this is just for the three-dimensional case, right? So when we when we will try non-commutative things for the orbits, it of course promises to be far more exciting. But this one is difficult enough for now. 
Right. So this is all I wanted to tell. So all the mini pictures are there. So we can find some mirrors. We don't know the non-commutative part yet. And I'm, of course, very happy to take suggestions. And I stop here. Thank you very much for listening. Now we party. <laughs> right.